my life is about helping other people that want to not use anymore because I tried so hard. I tried so hard to do it by myself and I just kept failing. So part of my mission is to help others. It's kind of a spiritual program, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, it's, it's, I, I didn't get sober to get successful. I got sober to be of service so that my pain uh, of not being able to be sober makes sense and it helps other people. And that is the best it gets. That's the best it gets is being of service. I'm never unhappy if I'm in service. Never. Hey, what's up, Vox and Hops heads? I'm Matt, the vocalist of Cryptopsy and the host of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast, brought to you by Sound Telemedia and Evergreen Podcasts, where I sit down with fellow metal musicians, talk all about their lives and music while sharing a craft beer. I hope that you had a killer weekend. I most certainly did. This Vox and Hops episode is presented by Heavy Montreal. Heavy Montreal are Montreal's premier metal promoter, and I'm very stoked to have teamed up with them to bring you the third edition of Vox and Hops, Brutal Montreal. That's right, Brutal Montreal is back. This year's event is happening on April 15th at M. Tellus and features performances by Clutch, Amigo the Devil, and Nate Bergman. If you're planning on coming to this event, you should absolutely pick up your tickets very soon because the tickets are simply disappearing. You can head on over to my website, voxandhops.com slash brutalmtl to pick up your tickets. I'm beyond stoked to have Heavy Montreal behind the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast. We are now in the second week of Sober February. I'm super stoked to have Pitch Black North sponsoring Sober February for the second year in a row. They make delicious tea. All of their teas are ethically sourced and only created in small batches. If you would like to pick up some satanic tea, you can do so by going to voxenhops.com slash satanic tea. That's V-O-X-A-N-D-H-O-P-S dot com slash satanic tea. The satanic tea lord himself has created a promo code for all you Vox and Hops heads. So when you're checking out use the promo code vox hops 15 that's vox hops 15 and you will save 15 percent off of your entire purchase i'm beyond stoked to have pitch black north sponsoring vox and hops is sober february now i'm very stoked that on today's artist spotlight i am showcasing a band called moths get ready everyone here is space force from moths <laughs>
Um, that was sweet. I really enjoyed all the progressive elements in Space Force, the track that I just played from Moths. If you enjoyed this track, and go check it out because it's actually out right now. This album dropped on August 12th back in 2022. They are in the process right now of setting up a U.S. tour, which they're hoping to do in September 2023. If you enjoyed Space Force, you can go and check out more stuff from Moths via the link in the description of this podcast. Do it, people. Support what you love. Now, before we jump into today's episode, I'd just like to ask you to follow the Vox and Hops Metal podcast on the podcast platform of your choice. But more than that, I would love for you to tell a friend about the podcast. If there's someone in your life that is just a killer extreme metal vocalist, well, you should let them know that the Vox and Hops Metal podcast exists. You can tell them that there are over 390 episodes where I sit down with some of the world's best metal musicians. We talk all about their lives and music while sharing a craft beer. If you were to encourage one of your killer extreme vocalist friends to become a brand new Vox and Hops head, that would be something that I would truly appreciate. Now, today on the podcast, I am beyond stoked to be joined by Melissa Cross, the vocal coach on the wonderful human behind the Zen of Screaming. Get ready, everyone. This is Vox and Hops episode number 393. I warn you, what you are about to hear is very disturbing indeed. Hey, what's up, everyone? Today, I'm very, very stoked to be with the one, the only, Melissa Cross. Um, the best. I'm, I'm, I'm so, so excited. Like it took me all, at this point probably almost 400 episodes to hang out with someone that's just so important uh, to me. Someone that I've heard her voice in my ear so many times, countless times, and during very intimate moments of my day when I'm on tour, like when I'm brushing my hair. We'll get into that more as we go into this. Um, obviously, known as a vocal coach. I call you more of an extreme vocal coach. It's more in the line I like. Uh, Zen of Screaming, such an influential piece of material, such an influential thought process to the the art of teaching extreme vocals. Big introduction just to say, how you doing? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Hope I can live up to all that. Yeah, it's a uh, Zen of Screaming. Uh, it was a service. It wasn't a... It wasn't for any reason, except that there were a lot of people that wanted to learn how to do this and I couldn't teach them all. And I was, it was almost like a public service announcement. Like everybody needs to learn this because everybody's coughing blood. And this is a really great genre of music that I don't want to disappear. So let me just make a little Xerox of, of the technique. Well, of course the Xerox became a video, but, but I never meant it to be, um, I didn't, think that it was going to be as successful as it was that's for sure well there was definitely no definitely a need for it and you're 100 percent right there a lot of people got into extreme vocals with no background in it because there was no background in it it was trial by fire you had to get up on stage you had to do it night after night and some people were better at it than others just innately and then some mm -hmm. people needed a helping hand we'll, we'll dig more into that later vox and hops is all about hanging out with my metal friends, talking about their lives and music, and typically about craft beer. But this is a sober February episode, so we're not going to be talking much about beer. Um, what are you drinking on your side tonight, Melissa, that we will be sharing virtually? Uh, Poland Spring. <laughs> yes, the cleanest of liquids. <laughs> a windmill. <laughs> on my side i have something uh that sort of fits the thematic of it this is throat of lucifer uh it is a albertan peppermint and lavender tea by the satanic tea company pitch black north i absolutely love this company from calgary alberta um he makes the best satanic tea you know what do you what do you want you know it's it's it is what it oh, is that's amazing it's awesome it's it's really really awesome and dominic the satanic tea lord himself uh, is uh, fully behind Sober February as a main sponsor for it. So cheers to him. Uh, let's just keep dancing uh, into the soundtrack of your youth. Uh, when you were growing up in your parents or guardians' house, what music was playing when you were not in control of the radio? What music did your parents or guardians listen to? Classical music. Ah. Um, I w and, and some musical theater, but mostly classical music. Like I would play games with my dad, like he would play like a, a piece and I would try to guess what it was. And I could do it in two bars. Really? Like he would go, and I go, fuck. 
I was very, I had a very good ear. So uh, I could even tell like what orchestra it was. Mm. I could even tell like, the air on the microphone. Like I have very like, uh, which is probably why I ended up being a voice teacher because I have an ear that is extremely precise. So I could always, so that's what, what we were listening to is classical music and uh, Broadway. But when I was around six, my dad was listening to 45s and he gave me a little portable record player with these 45s and a spindle that was fat. And I had this, like a stack of about 25 little 45s stuck on this spindle. And I would listen to the Everly Brothers, um, like um, uh, Jan and Dean, like some like 50 stuff, like Elvis Presley, like that, that uh, this was before the Beatles. My first oh. record was the Beatles. Wow. Meet the Beatles, age seven. Wow. It's so exciting. Just goose I have goosebumps just thinking about that experience of, of being <laughs> yes, that's that. so cool. <laughs> seven years old and, and and the Beatles are new and exciting yes. and, and that yes. Ed, Ed Sullivan show and watching Ed this. Sullivan. Exactly. I watched Ed Sullivan. Yeah. I saw that show when they were on. I, you know, I list, I saw, you know, shows like Hullabaloo and uh, Bandstand, American Bandstand. Like these were my, this was my youth. So, you know, I am so blessed to have seen so many great artists. I've been a rock chick since I was six, right? six years old. And I've seen like so many cool things and I am just truly blessed. And the reason that I'm so devoted to metal is because metal is the closest thing there is to what it was in the beginning. Mm -hmm. The, the uh, attitude of uh, rebellion. Of, yes. Uh, Very pure. Trying to, like, to be an outlier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're not cool. We're cool. Get the out of our way. <laughs> Your, your your parents being super into classical Broadway, uh, what was their reaction to your your passion about rock music? You know, I fl uh, when I got into very, in, uh, I left home when I was thirteen hmm. to go to acting school. I mean, actually, I went to music school, but I was a troubled child, and I was kind of a what we call a spooky chick. Like I wore black, I wore armband against the war. I wrote poetry. I was kind of dark. I was a dark chick. And uh, I felt different from everybody. So I convinced my wonderful parents to let me go to boarding school for the arts. Really? So I left when I was 13. And I went to the Interlochen Arts Academy, which is in northern Michigan. Wow. Uh, and I got on a piano scholarship. But actually, I, uh, I ended up in theater there mm. and voice. I started young. Did I started, you? Sorry, did you find any like-minded people at the school? Was that, that that must have been what you were aspiring to do? Trying to go there, feeling like such a, a sp being called a spooky chick, let's say. Um, yes. Did you find any like-minded people that were then your people? All of them. They were oh, all amazing. weird. They were all <laughs> weird. They all smoked a lot of marijuana in the woods and in practice rooms, and there were the geeks. And then there were like the, the stoners and like the stoners were the one that I kind of fit in with just because mm. that was the time. That was the time. <laughs> that was what we did <laughs> in 1970 something, right? 1960. Let's see, I was at Interlock in, in 1971. Amazing. Amazing. Piano was, was the, the first passion of yours. Yeah. Was that well, by choice or were, were you pushed onto a piano at a young age? Uh, okay, so my first passion was the Beatles, <laughs> and, but it was also ballet. Like ballet, oh. a thing that when I was much younger, I just was in love with ballet. Like they have, there's a song called Everything is Beautiful at the Ballet. The ballet was so beautiful that I kind of lived in that fantasy and I decided I was going to be the best ballerina in the world. So when I was six, I was in ballet class and the, the Bolshoi Ballet came to town auditioned extras for their ballet. My legs and arms and neck was too short. I was the best. They jumped the highest. I could turn the most. 
they didn't want me to audition because I didn't look right. So you're not I was aesthetically crushed. fitting, fitting the ballerina. That's horrible. I mean, Especially six years old. Oh, yeah, but I got that when I had been studying for six years and I was 12. Oh, so okay. it was even worse. Mm -hmm. It was even worse. But then I decided, okay, I'm going to be the best actress in the world. And I got myself in a play. I got, worked for a repertory company. I was in a musical. This is all before I'm 13, right? So uh, I definitely like an entertainer. No doubt about it. I, yeah. I started doing this when I was four. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. See, I've, I've seen and I've read a lot about you, but there's always little things you discover as you talk to people. I think that's so fucking cool about having a podcast. Um, how about your first shows? Do you remember the first show you went to go see? The first show I saw was The Who. <laughs> that's fucking awesome. Before Tommy. Wow. Before Tommy. So I saw them sing uh, My Generation, uh, uh, Magic Bus. Uh, it was when Keith Moon was like, just they were destroying their equipment yeah. at the Every show, yep, I saw that. That was my first concert. My grandmother took me. Your grandmother took you. <laughs> so your family's always very catered and focused on the arts, <laughs> obviously. The next show I saw was Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix. Wow. <laughs> In a club. Legendary. In a club. Wow. <laughs> it's unbelievable. So music, music, and, and and art is just all around you all the time. You've you've been you're like needleworking your way throughout all of these amazing experiences, even from such a young age till yeah. today, where you're working with all of the biggest stars in rock and metal. It's it's very impressive. I'm very very enthralled right now. Do you remember? So yeah, go ahead. Sorry, do you remember your first time on stage? And I imagine it was either ballet if you were doing it that early. And 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 yes. performing always being a big part of yourself. Um, what what was your I mean, mindset before that show, and were you ready? Did you like performing? I had no idea what what, what it was going to be, but I remember so well the the glow through the curtain. Like it was the curtain it was almost my time to. It was a ballet, a ballet by Martha Graham, a Martha Graham dancer. My mother got me the best ballet teacher like Martha Graham do you know what Martha Graham is no I'm Martha sorry. Graham the very very well-known modern ballet company from New York and I in San Antonio Texas lucked out and got a teacher that used to be in that company so we have a cutting edge kind of modern ballet dancer that's teaching me classical ballet but she put on a ballet with the symphony in town and I got to be in it and I just remember it being really pitch black dark backstage and the light coming through the curtain it's almost time for me to go on and I have I'm in love with that thing I'm in love with that dark and that glow of the stage light it's like it's almost time to go on it's almost time here we go go you know I just like I, I my first stage performance was um a ballet but the next one was um well there was church choir like I loved choir uh, my parents were not religious but i i love the music and like the ceremony with church so i went to church with my grandmother and i got in the choir and i was a soloist in the choir and then i was in a play called gypsy and i go hello everybody my name is june what's yours and then da, 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 with the tap shoes and all that yeah <laughs> that was the third one <laughs> I, I heard you were discovered in a subway and that's when you got oh. your big, big break. This is much later, obviously. Okay, so uh, the sub, that's a that's a I had already been in a bunch of punk bands and stuff by the time I hit the subway. When I got into New York, I had a day job. I had a band. I had a day job where I was working as a secretary. Like I would was a legal secretary. I worked for like the lawyer for. Oh, sorry about that. No stress. Okay. We can you just take it from working for a lawyer. Yeah, I was working for this uh, lawyer that was the lawyer for you too, and the lawyer for um, all the A and R people in New York. Anyway, I was sick of working in the office, sick of it, and so basically, I 
said, if I have to be alive, I am, I'm not going to do it. I'd rather be dead than, than do this. So I'm just going to take my ball and go home and get my guitar and go down in the subway. Because if that's the way I'm going to die, I'm going to die starving doing that. Because that's all I want to do. Okay. That's what I'm, so I went down in the subway as, you know, like, uh, uh, this is, this is what I'm going to do. And almost like within a couple of weeks, this guy that owned a studio sort of said, I want you in my studio and got an investor and it went to Sony and, but you know, one of those things. I have lots of stories like that. <laughs> <laughs> I have lots of stories like that. It's because you're so in, entwined with the industry. That, that, that's something that's resonating. And well, the passion the, of the arts. The, the big deal was, is that I had, I was courted by a lot of major labels. At one point, I was like, you know, that bid war thing where, yeah. you know, the label went by. So I was like, you know, the, the thing, the next big thing. But I also had a really bad drug problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, I showed up to my showcase blasted and I mm -hmm. destroyed I destroyed everything I gave. I mean, that lawyer for you too. And Pat Benatar became my lawyer and I embarrassed that shit out of him. So um, I was blacklisted because I was terrible. I had decided I was going to detox from heroin, you know, the night before, and I was not ready to perform. It was bad. So it even came out in the New York times. It was devastating. Wow. Had she paused the breath or had she finished? Yep, she's finished all right. It's like written in the New York Times. <laughs> so that was like, that was when it almost happened and it didn't happen. And I'm glad it didn't happen because I never would have been here if I act, I probably would have, I probably would have been dead if I had, had uh, gone on because I was a very sick, very sick person. I'm not sick anymore. Not really. <laughs> Which is a great thing. <laughs> Very happy that you're doing much better, obviously. Uh, but yes. also, had that not have happened and had you moved through everything and, and had you been picked up, hypothetically, you would have never okay. been the voice coach that you are now. Correct. So so Correct. What, what, what was that line where you get better or take care of yourself and start becoming a voice coach instead of trying to make it yourself, let's say? Okay, well, it was, I wasn't, I was a little more stubborn than that. <laughs> <laughs> Life tends to be that way, right? <laughs> the message, but what happened was, um, uh, I finally, uh, like, I had, I'd started teaching, and, and a student, I think he was uh, uh, the lover of Seymour Stein. Seymour Stein is a, a record label mogul who started, um, Oh God, what's the one that had the Ramones and Blondie and like, I can't remember the, the name of that record label. But anyway, it was like the one where the, that big, you know, new wave in America came like, you mm -hmm. know, but Sire was called Sire Records. Okay, so uh, I went into his office and played some songs and he said, these are brilliant songs. I love the stories in your songs. They're great songs, right? But you're too old. I was like- oh. Okay, I got it. Thanks for your honesty, right? And then I knew, I knew it was time to make the record that I was going to be proud of and then give it up. I was going to give it up because I was like, okay, but I haven't made like the the record. So I made that record and I um, got pregnant. Mm. It was just not on purpose, but I, I got married and, and I always wanted to be a mom. And, you know, Seymour Stein said I was too old. So... <laughs> I made the record of the music that I love, that I'm proud of. And then I stopped doing it to have a baby. And that was it. And, but I was already teaching and loving it. I, you know, when I went in the subway, one time that I went in the subway, this lady asked me if I would teach her how to do it. I said, sure, because I needed the money. Right. Mm -hmm. And I taught her. It was the first lesson that I taught and I loved it. I loved it. I was like, I know so much. How do I know all this? Oh, because <laughs> for like 15 years, you know, but I didn't even, didn't even occur to me to teach. But when I was doing it, I was good at it. And I liked it. I liked being helpful. And I liked no, like getting good results. 
So I had no problem with it. I, I was, it was an easy transition. I like it just as much as performing. Uh, do you have any voice teachers throughout those 15 years prior to you starting that really impacted you? Is there someone that you could put your finger on that was a big part of everything that you've built up from before you started even thinking about the extreme voice parts? There have been great teachers in my life. None of them were great voice teachers until the one voice teacher that I have now. However, the great teachers that I had was there was two ballet teachers. And it's, you know, once you get when you're talking about performance, it doesn't really matter what medium it is. It's pretty much um, the the universal truths about authenticity and honesty and not there, there's a lot of similarities with all of the performing arts. So I think that the most influential teacher in terms of performance uh, were my ballet teachers, but my present voice teacher has an incredible impact to this day because he's also a voice scientist. Okay. So okay. everything that I know, I know from him because I've been studying voice science since 85. I I, I lost my voice at CBGB's. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I, I let out this, this scream that, and I didn't know how to do it right. And I got a small injury and I wasn't allowed to sing. And back then they said, okay, you're on vocal rest for six months. So six months, I couldn't sing, and I started learning voice science because I was like, damn, I'm not going to get caught like this. I am I need to know the car. I need to yeah. know where's the – I want to fix the car myself. So I started in 1985 and never stopped. So the thing that I'm most proud of is that I've really studied it very, like, with a great deal of dedication and integrity. Like, I don't make shit up. I don't make it up. Like, I don't say, you know, if I don't know the answer, I say, I don't know the answer. And so I'm very proud of that because um, the voice is incredibly complex. It, it, it's, it, it involves aerodynamics, acoustic theory, uh, physics, like resonant. I mean, there's so many like disciplines that all come together with this. It's, unbelievably complex and most people don't know what they're talking about so i say i don't know what i'm talking about because the more i learn about the voice the less i know mm -hmm. it's constantly evolving constantly. and constantly. the technology especially since 85 has definitely changed a lot the instruments that we examine the voice with mm -hmm. the camera like I have like slow motion, high speed cameras that are slow motion of vocal folds that I'm looking at that, that were not available then. Right. So I've, I've been, you know, I'm fascinated with it. So my voice teacher, Richard, is a wonderful classical teacher and a, he also teaches uh, Broadway musical theater, but it's not about the genre. I am finding that voice, whether the genre is opera or metal or country a voice is a voice a vowel is a vowel and they're all the same like, it's like there's a, a kind of misinterpretation that people have that if it's a different genre of music that the voice is doing something completely different and it's not not at all it's the, it's it's all doing the same pretty much the same thing and it's complex and if you let me, I'll start yakking and you, you would be so bored. So I'm not going to let you, do, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> definitely, definitely not bored at all. Um, it's all about vibrations. It's very interesting, the human voice. It's it's about it's flesh vibrant. and space. And it's, it's, it's exactly it. It's, it's, it is space. That's mm -hmm. like people say, there's the resonator. There is no resonator. A resonator is an open space. <laughs> I think it's super interesting. And um, I have been using your warm up CD since the Zen is Screaming since 2005, every single time, just about. I do anything and I've never lost my voice, Melissa. And, and a lot of it probably ties into the fact that I do that. So, so thank you for that. I've done 35 days well. in a row. I've done multiple days in the studio, multiple hours in a row. 
I record monster sounds for video games. And I think a lot of it ties down to the 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 base knowledge that has been brought to the many years of studying voice and 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 warming it up properly and taking care of it. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I read that you got inspired to to get into um, extreme stuff uh, after being at a Slayer Megadeth show, watching the Mosh Pit, and you were there mm -hmm. with your friend. And then that same friend happened to be working at a studio a few years later, and they were like, "Melissa, we need you to come. There's these singers that they they can't get through." A session without coughing up blood and those two people ended up being shadows fall and kill switch engage just unbelievable just just the, once again the you connections studied. you studied <laughs> that's exactly what happened uh you know uh, and my it was uh rest in peace morgan walker who was uh recording a lot of these bands like he had shia lude and uh uh, uh um hate breed um, like so many bands back then, like this bands you've never heard of, like Dismay, a lot of Connecticut bands. And mm -hmm. the studio was in his house and he would drive these bands around and do their sound. And he was trying to make a kind of utopia because he saw that this was a thing. The new wave of American heavy metal. Yes, yes. yes. And I saw it, too. And I saw it from a balcony looking down at the mosh pit going, oh, my God. This is like, we're not in Kansas anymore. This is what it was like when I was 13. All mm. these people, that they look kind of alike. They had the hand signals. They got the, the you know, it, it's like, it's here. And then I, I was like, damn, I'm too old. Like, yeah. what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And then two weeks later, I got that phone call. So unbelievable. So, so you get thrown into this, this hot pan whatever, whatever horrible expression you get thrown into the situation much better you get thrown into the situation and you're in the studio with someone that's doing much harsher vocals than you've probably ever worked with i'm assuming i, I could be wrong there uh, what was your first mental approach to it the first thing i did was i didn't freak out because i had been exposed to it because i'd seen um slayer and megadeth i mean i'd seen what was going on but what I did was instead of flipping out, I listened to what I was listening to. So it's like, okay, that sounds like white noise. That sounds like a, like a pressure toilet, like at the park, you know, that, that, that whoosh, you know, like <laughs> that, I, I started making up like these um, kind of similarities with like industrial kind of noises. And then I figured out a way to make those noises quietly. And, and to make those noises quietly with a flow, flow phonation kind of way. So it, 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 and then once I got it up to a certain volume, I put it on the microphone and it was huge. Yeah. I mean, it was loud, but I didn't have to be loud. So that was like a big, uh, you know, kind of like, whoa. Like I just went, yeah! and it was like, Psh! it was so loud because that a periodic like white noise because humans are a lot more sensitive at like 5k 8k right that sound is much louder to humans so that high frequency that yeah, yeah right what i just did was much louder to you than it is in this room interesting because is that because of a, the way human evolution is trained to catch babies when they're crying I actually think that the answer is yes, because I have also seen a rooster, a rooster, like, doo -doo 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 -doo, right, has the same format as, yeah, right, and the roosters wakes up the barn, yeah, right, yeah. so it's, there are some, like, evolutionary ideas about frequency and, you know, utility, and certainly I'm taking that and telling everybody that you don't need to be loud, <laughs> Yeah, it's, about control. It's, the effort. <laughs> it's about control it's about airflow and control that's what i tell myself very often on stage flow it's that okay now here's the thing though and, and i know that you probably want to do this later but flow is different than blow so flow is something like when you chant and you go a b c d e f g a b c d e f g a b c d e f g. see i'm just flowing right chanting 
I'm chanting. That's the voice loves that. But most people do it the blow way where they use air as part of the sound. So it's a different mechanism that goes and that's a completely different anatomy. Those mm-hmm. two sounds. Right. And the flow way has the higher frequency and it's the least effort. But mm-hmm. the blow way has a different sound that some people prefer from time to time. But the blow way is effort, a lot of effort, a lot. And so the trick is, is to give everybody as much, you know, f- awareness and faculty to like do all of them so that you have the right tool to do the sound that you want. And you're not trying to push the more efforted one all the time because Absolutely. touring is rough. Touring is Absolutely. rough. It's like having a tool belt and reaching for the right tool at the right moment. Exactly. exactly. The right brush, the right color, the right. Yeah. So you're definitely the first extreme vocal coach, I would say. And, and I, I correct me if I'm wrong here. Was there anyone else before you? No. So, so, so you, you, you paved the way hashing out everything on your own, which is very interesting. You were studying the voice, obviously, for 15 to 17 years before you got thrown into that situation where you stepped into the studio and you had to discover all these sounds and how to do them with a flow, not a blow, to get them smooth and getting people. Out there. And then obviously people started talking, right? So so there's this, there's this girl. There's this girl that knows how to do it. She's going to save you. And it just it just blew up. It just blew up. And the person that told everybody that he was coming, but he never showed up, no. he canceled every time, but he told everybody that he was coming is Jamie Josta. Really? So I never got to teach Jamie Josta, but Jamie Josta told everybody that he was going to visit and they all came except him. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Jamie. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jamie. Thank, thank you for joining I, I, I've given Jamie a sandwich, as he likes to say, when I had him on the podcast, because he definitely inspired Vox and Hops. So, so I, I've given him my sandwich, and you, you, you've given him his good sandwich. <laughs> um, what, what, what do you think about being like location-wise, being from New York? Did that have any impact on being so connected to the scenes? Is it, do you think that had a, a reason why it, it worked so well for you at that time, with all the studios being around there, or was it really just word of mouth? Well, I was in bands myself. So I came to New York as an artist in, mm-hmm. in a band. I mean, I had a band in, in Los Angeles um, with, you know, I was playing with opening for bands like the Circle Jerks, Black Flag, X, um, the Blasters, um, Berlin, the Go-Go's. I worked in a record store next to The Mask. So, and I had, I'd been in England for uh, many years and I had this section in the record store called the new wave section. So all these musicians in LA would come to my little section, my import section with all, (laughs) so I got to know everybody and and, and I got a band, but then my drug problem, like helped me make a great escape and come to New York to get away from all the drugs in California. <laughs> I was really successful. Um, but um, yeah, I came to New York and that was another music city. So the reason that I came to New York is because I w- wanted to do a band. The thing is, is that I wanted to be Janice. Since I'm 13, I love Janice and I love Joni Mitchell. Those two women like completely took over for me. Joni, because of her poetry and her songwriting and her guitar playing, I love the open tunings and stuff. I'm a guitar player also. And um, and and Janice, because Janice had, she was the perfect piece of toast. She was my Corey Taylor. There's a great deal of similarity between Corey Taylor and Janice Joplin. And I had this admiration. So I was working on that sound and I wanted to get that sound. <laughs> I wanted Janice and I couldn't get it. And I got hurt doing it. So it was kind of like that my pain had a reason. Like my journey was made perfect sense. 
because I was trying to get that that husky thing and I would drink Southern Comfort. And I'd smoke cigarettes and like smoke dope and like do everything, you know, Jack Daniel, anything to make it like and it didn't always work like that. So I was on a quest and this quest met the, you know, early um, the early metal scene. Mm. Very, very interesting. Um nowadays the dvds let's just hit the dvds before we move to the next thing i had in my mind um you mentioned right as we were opening this up that it was like something you wanted to give the world because you just yes. simply couldn't book couldn't yourself because you were There's just many- getting hounded 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 yeah hounded really and even when i raised my price it was still they still come So I said, you know what, I just better like, first of all, I really like these people. I love all of them. They were the coolest people. They would come down the, down the hallway and I'd be scared to death. There's big old (laughs) tattooed, like, you know, they look scary. And they were the most respectful, polite and charming people. And it was family. There's this band called H2O from Mm -hmm. way back early hardcore right and they had this song called friends like family and that's what it is everybody is like tight together Mm -hmm. this family and i needed a family (laughs) i've always been an an outsider and i found my home and so i wanted to do it um almost as a service to the the genre that gave me a home (laughs) And you released two DVDs. The first, I had the first personally. Uh, the second I had, I've seen, but I didn't have it. I was with people we were on tour. Um, and then the internet really blew up. And then you probably had to change your approach to how you can hit lots of people by doing like online classes, uh, giving seminars. Uh, how much did the internet um, have an impact on what you were doing with Zen of Screaming at the time? Well, the internet... Uh... Hmm. What happened that made this different is that people stopped, Apple stopped putting a, a, a DVD slot in the laptop. <laughs> I mean, basically, people stopped watching DVDs and it was MP4s. So that's what changed it over is that um, the post office was costing way too much. Like to send a DVD, like a lot of people from Latvia and, you know, Eastern Europe and the North Pole and Iran, like people were buying the Zen of Screaming from all over the world. And it cost more than the DVD to send the DVD. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. it was like ridiculous. So also I not didn't like having to hire somebody to do the shipping. It was just, so this is much easier. And I also... My because of the Zen of screaming, my voice lessons became expensive, and I felt it was so unmetal to have voice lessons that cost more than most people could afford. So I said, I've got to make this accessible to people. This genre is important. People's voices are important. So that's how the classes came. So I have these classes. It's like thirteen hours of everything I know, Amazing. and it. You know, 13 hours of class for the price of one and a half privates and you get recordings and everything. So that's, of course, people say, no, I want to run one on one. I want one on one. I'm like, you're so (laughs) dumb. You're so dumb. Because, you know, one on one people come and they talk and they talk about this and that and they spend all this time yakking. But it's 13 concentrated straight hours of everything I know for less than 500 bucks. You should take that. Absolutely. (laughs) <laughs> people don't want to do the work they want to be like be touched by me and think that they can you know it's like it's like that people that school of rock thing you know you take like three years of school of rock and you think that you you know you're ready for a record contract it's like no you have to work you have Just to do the work you got to put the yeah. work if you want to do anything in life you do the work, man. <laughs> something that you have done and i'm sure you know this is that you've you've inspired countless other vocal coaches to also teach extreme vocals now what what is your thought about that um everyone and their brother has taught or sister has taught extreme vocals to people even i've given extreme vocal classes back in the day i would do one lesson with people and i'd be like you got it just do that i, I didn't know what the hell i was doing so 
that didn't last for very long. So what, what is your thought on the, the massive expanse in vocal coaches that do teach extreme vocals? If, you know, if it, if it, if it works great, I, I'm a little bit, um, uh, skeptical that long-term results are possible to get from somebody who doesn't know what they're doing, especially if you don't know the difference between a male voice and a female voice, you know, there are things that you need to know about the voice <laughs> to be an, um, to be an effective teacher, because if you teach by imitation, that is, a, it's very difficult to retain the skill by mm -hmm. imitation because you don't remember what it felt like. You remember what it sounded like, but you, you, you can't reproduce it in, unless you have a way in which you can label what you felt, right? You can take that with you, but the, the imitate, like do this, oh, oh, and you go, oh, oh, okay, I'm ready for the show. But then you get on stage and you can't hear yourself and it's not, it's not the same thing. So there's all kinds of things about breath pressure and resonance. And I mean, you know, what it above the pencil, all that stuff that I teach above that pencil. above the pencil, right? That's, <laughs> remember that, you know, above it the pencil, it works. Above, I know, and it has nothing to do with what it is. That's the hard thing about the voice is that the voice above the pencil, there's nothing going on above the pencil. It's all happening here. But mm -hmm. the idea of above the pencil means that the vocal tract makes more space and it sort of sympathetically vibrates on the skull, which makes it feel like there's some activity happening here. And that is because you're engaging like the third and fourth resonance, which is what, you know, like there's a lot of stuff that you need to understand to, to come up with the the uh, analogies or the metaphors that you need to teach with, because it, there's no steering wheels in these places that we use for screaming. There's no steering wheel on my vocal cords. There's no steering wheel on my, on my breath pressure. It's all kind of imaginative stuff. You know, like when I talk, I am saying what I mean and what I mean is in my imagination. I'm meaning something it's in my head. Well, that's the only way that my voice knows how to respond is that I mean something. Do, 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 do. I didn't choreograph. Do, 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 do. I meant it and I did that. So getting all the science inside the imagination so that it works in a present moment from the stage takes many, many years to do. It takes many years Above all, do no harm. That's what I would like to say to everybody that's teaching other people. Do no harm because you can. You mm -hmm. can. Mm -hmm. I mean, I take lessons still, not only because I want to know more, but also because I want to know what it's like to have the responsibility. Like uh, when I go to my teacher, I'm the no, I don't know anything. I'm going to trust you to teach me something that you know, and I'm going to believe you. That's a big responsibility. So it reminds me of that. When I teach somebody, I remember what I feel like as a student. So uh, I think it's important to do no harm. That's what I'd say. I hear the biggest crock of shit every time. <laughs> People are really bad at this. <laughs> and they say, they say, they make it up. They just make shit up, right? They just to sound good, you know? Oh, the false chords are, you know, like uh, the other day I, I heard, um, uh, let's see, what? Uh, the false chords are singing. False chords cannot sing. You cannot make a pitch with your false chords. You cannot. So if you hear a note, like eh, or ee, or beep. if you hear any pitch, it's coming from your vocal cords mm -hmm. because there's no way that <sighs> can make a pitch. <laughs> there is a lot more terminology that's thrown around. The, yes. the, the, the fry scream, the false chords. Yeah, so fry scream is your true vocal faults and there's no lift. So you're not doing coughing up the loogie vomit thing with fry screaming. You're doing something completely different 
where you're using your true vocal folds and you're getting your vocal folds right ready to do a but instead of allowing them to do an oscillation you just bring them together and have them fart like that's what that's what fry is so yeah yeah that's fry this is also fry but i'm not going i'm not doing any here so there's two different ways to do it and the trick is to know everything because mm-hmm. that's where you get like the maximum amount of colors. You don't want to sound like, you know, bah, 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 all the same. <laughs> it's boring as shit. <laughs> Which is exactly where I was heading. Why in this new age of, of extreme vocals, let's say, basically they really started in, let's say, popular, popular music in the <laughs> late 70s. 80s having more harsh vocals in music and then nowadays there's people like will ramos from lorna shore that can do just about any voice at any moment that he wants why is there such an evolution do you think in extreme vocals well actually will ramos is um um we're working together will ramos is a, a a very interesting vocalist and he does things differently than anyone else. He has an incredible coordination. Like basically Will Ramos learned throat singing, Tuvan mm-hmm. throat singing. And Tuvan throat singing requires a certain coordination. It's difficult to explain, but Tuvan throat singing is one note, right? It's one note. So you go, uh, right? But you go, uh, and you have this lower, uh, yeah. So I'm going, uh, but that bottom octave, uh, that that's a great deal of control to to uh, awareness to do. And then there's a, the top part of it, which is so there's a resonance on the top. There's a, a drone on the bottom. And Will started doing learning that. So he has an incredible coordination of that flow thing. And he also um, recently there's a, a YouTube thing. I don't know if you saw Throat Camera. I did. Where's a voice teacher, right? Okay. So he also has this thing where he his epiglottis like twerks over like to the to the. So he's doing something like with his larynx, right? <laughs> and I believe that he's making like he sounds like the Concord, mm. right? He sounds like a jet engine. And I believe that there are some shapes that he is making that is causing like this, like extra jet stream kind of stuff that's much different than what most people do. However, right, there's always stuff to learn and he doesn't do any, he doesn't do any fry. He's not doing any fry. So Will Ramos is working his ass off, but... He has no trouble because his control is superb, superb, right? Just absolute. He can speak all day. He can like, he's, um, and that's because, you know, the coordination that I'm talking about is basic impedance. It's the right amount of air pressure and the right amount of vocal fold activity, just like the impedance of your voice in a mic. There's that perfect sweet spot where the gain is just right for the master and everything is right. Well, Will has that <laughs> with his voice and his air pressure. So he's got great coordination, just amazing. And I can't wait. I'm, I'm, um, I was just talking to him last night where um, I went to the Christmas party. Oh, so cool. I saw the pictures there. Yeah. 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 I went to the Christmas party and uh, we talked afterwards. So he wants to um, do a, a little, you know, real and i want to do a real so we're going to do some stuff together amazing that makes me very happy and i'm I'm also happy that that they're so huge right now and there's a lot of kids that are going to be getting into metal and discovering metal because uh, of their notoriety and how popular and cool he is on like social media and they're going to like immediately get inspired by one of the best out there so who knows what's going to be happening in 10 15 years when those kids are then on stage he's amazing He's really amazing. I, um, nice guy, too. Absolutely. Uh, this is a Vox and Humps Sober February episode. 
uh, you mentioned a few times that um, drugs and alcohol were a big problem and it basically steered you completely off track of, of your first love, your first goal, which was to be a performing artist. Uh, take me to those moments that morning being the, the New York Times, you mentioned that that the big bidding war artist wasn't going to be the the big star because she decided yeah. to not not <laughs> be in her top performance form let's say uh the 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 time when when you realized that i had to stop basically if you'd like to open up about that well okay so the good thing about that is that i ran away from home because i embarrassed my, my husband was in that band and uh, you know i you know i ran away from my home and I hid in Connecticut in that guy that the guy that that was doing the sound for all the bands I went to his house he's my friend in Connecticut and late at night I'm listening to the radio and the dials all the way to the left and I'm hearing this college radio and I'm hearing like live from the anthrax in Connecticut right and I'm hearing this like I don't know what it was it was like yeah <laughs> is that what is that i didn't know what it was because i hadn't seen the slayer thing yet and i but it's interesting that that week that i escaped was the first that i actually heard it but i didn't know what it was until i went to that that concert so it's interesting how these things were working oh, yeah. almost working, and i didn't know that things were working i was you know as usual freaking out about yeah. everything and yeah. everything was kind of going the way it was supposed to go <laughs> But um, so you got opening up, um, you know, drugs, drug addiction is a disease. And I had it really badly and I uh, was very stubborn because I didn't think I had a disease. It's the only disease that tells you you don't have it. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a lot of denial about it. Um, but once I got sober, the thing that happened is that I got very confessional so I was more of like a, a big rocker and you know, like, you know, like I loved Susie and the Banshees and, you know, Nina Hagen and the, all the actress, performing things. actress. There, yeah. yeah. And I was like, and Janice, I mm -hmm. like that. Stuff. And all of a sudden I got like very acoustic, very confessional. And then I got sick of that because it wasn't like rocking enough. <laughs> it's like, it's like, and then I got too old. So that's how it, that's, you know, and, and I love to teach, but um, my recovery is still an important part of my life. I'm still sober. Um, I did have some relapses, uh, but now I have 24 years back. Amazing. Congrats. Thanks. And it, it, it's something that's really also prevalent in the metal scene, but I'm seeing more and more younger bands coming up and they're embracing not that Janis Joplin lifestyle that you were talking about earlier, where they're going to smoke and drink, and that's a part of their persona. It, it's not a thing of what's happening nowadays anymore, and that's refreshing. No, it's old. I mean, it's like uh, people say they're doing some cocaine. I was like, that's so eighties, man. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> if if people <laughs> ever you, you see friends around you or, or anyone that's listening to this right now feels like they need. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they feel like they this, your story is resonating with them. Uh, what would be your advice for them? I I could not do this alone. That is something that I I tried very hard to do it on my own, and it never worked. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't until I asked for help, and the people that I asked for help were also addicts and alcoholics. So I. You know, I tried church, I tried, you know, psychiatrists, I tried medication, I tried all that stuff. And it, it, it uh, I was medicating a chemical imbalance for sure. There was no doubt about it. Because once I got that, you know, the mental health piece, once I got sober, then I got the mental health piece. And then I got that medication, which I, I never would have used drugs if I'd had that medication. I promise Like that's, but anyway, I found the salvation of being of service as kind of like the, the, the way that life feels better is, is um, working for others and not being so self-centered. Mm. So 
definitely. But getting sober is impossible, was impossible for me to do on my own. It really was. I'm stubborn. <laughs> Which and is I like to which is, you know, I love it's hard. What? Which is hard because you're, you're feeling like you're continually letting yourself down. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Exactly. But and the mental yeah. world needs you now when you are in service. Uh, a typical week for, for Melissa Cross is, is giving one on one lessons, is, is getting panicked phone calls that you need to save someone in a studio situation to come. Do they, have, do they fly you out on tour hypothetically to? to not so much, not since, the pandemic, not since the pandemic. The pandemic kind of changed all that, but I do get usually two or three calls a day of, um, I have a cold, mm -hmm. um, can you warm me up? Um, I have some artists that I warm up every night on tour. Um, like on the phone, like a, a voice call. Uh, um, yep. I prefer the phone because with Zoom, there's like a, a, a sight like, thing. It's yeah. acting, right? But when they're on the phone, their eyes are closed and they feel the feel. They're not looking at anything. They're not, it's it's just very, it's only like 20, 25 minutes. So it's just a, it's like yoga. <laughs> mm, you, you know, it's like oh, yeah. you feel oh, yeah. things. It's not about making sounds or making noises. It's about, my warm up is functional. So there's a purpose for everything. Like there's the exercise Z's, you know, these are Z's starting with this. Note. Remember? <laughs> yeah, <I remember. laughs> I'm having post-traumatic shakes right now. From the... <laughs> <laughs> there's times, there's times that I have my phone on shuffle. And it yeah, there it comes. And I'm like, no. <laughs> There it comes. These. It's a phone sex voice, right? These are Z's. <laughs> Starting with this note. Ready? <laughs> I don't remember how, ready. Many, how many takes you did until you're like, no, that's perfect. Okay. <laughs> that's the I one. I would have changed it if I'd heard it, believe me, but it's a classic now, so whatever. Yes. Uh, but they're functional. Like, so those Z's, like, Z's, it's is for flow. So you don't do Z's like z, 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 z. You go z. So it's flow. Z. So everything has a purpose. It's not a bunch of noises or syllables on notes. You're supposed to be engaging in an imagery with it. And that imagery, like above the pencil, like you don't go e, you go e. Now that e, you're never going to set make that sound in the set. None of these sounds belong in the set. But when I go, I'm engaging the cricothyroid mechanism, <laughs> which stretches and loosens my vocal folds into high notes and low notes. And I blend the register. So I don't go, ee, I go, ee, like I blended something that didn't feel like too. Anyway, that's technical. I don't want to give I it like all it. away. No, I'm, 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 I'm very enthralled. Uh, the uh, <laughs> thank you so much for opening up about sobriety. Um, it's 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 important, and I like to to showcase it. I, I always do a month a year where I talk to artists specifically about that, and uh, I find myself speaking to more and more sober artists. The more that the podcast is growing, the more prominent artists I'm speaking to. A lot of them mm -hmm. tend to have danced through the dark dance. In February, I am going to be a part of a um, festival that's being put on by Jake Lures from um, August Burns Red. Mm -hmm. And it's a mental health, it's the heart support. Um, he has a, an organization called Heart Support. And that's a mental health like service organization. Amazing. And I'm really into that. I mean, I my life is about helping other people that want to not use anymore mm -hmm. because I tried so hard. I tried so hard to do it by myself and I just kept failing. Mm -hmm. So part of my mission is to help others. It's kind of a spiritual program, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, it's, it's, I, I didn't get sober to get successful. I got sober to be of service so that my pain 
uh, of not being able to be sober makes sense and it helps other people. And that is the best it gets. That's the best it gets is being of service. Uh I'm never unhappy if I'm in service. Never. Never unhappy in service. This is a Heavy Montreal Presents Vox and Hops episode. Uh, I'd love to hear about any experiences you've ever had in Montreal. What what does Montreal mean to you? Have you ever been here? Have you been to shows here? Well, what does Montreal mean to Melissa Cross? Well, I went to Montreal to audition for the National Theatre School of Canada really? when I was fifteen. But I was 15 years old that I was told I was too young. But I went down to this funky place. It was like it was kind of cool. It was like but very hipster kind of. And I went into this dress, (laughs) this dress store. And the guy that owned the store like tried to like molest me. (laughs) Yes. But I, you know, I, I got away. It's okay. It's all right. But I love Montreal, except that one thing. Yeah, fuck, that, fuck that guy. That, that one thing. <laughs> one thing was like, it didn't ruin it. But uh, I loved Montreal. And I love Alyssa. Um, yeah. White, white glue. Yeah. I uh, love her. And she's from there. Yep. And I love Quebec. Like the best meal I ever had was in Quebec City. Amazing. Yes, amazing. Alisa, Alisa is a fucking phenomenal performer. I've known her for many, many, many years. We grew up playing shows together before either of uh, us were doing anything. So I love her to death. And I also, there's a band I saw from, um, wait, you're from Montreal, right? Mm-hmm. No, these, no, he was from Toronto. Sorry, Toronto. Not as good. No, I'm joking. Not as good. <laughs> <laughs> It was counterparts. I saw counterparts oh, yeah, the other cool. day. Oh, they are cool then. <laughs> <laughs> um, Melissa, I have one last question. Um, but before, I have to give a massive shout out to Liz and Jason. A bucket list reviews for for making the introduction so that we can be having this chat today. I can't love can't love Liz and Jason enough. Uh, so massive cheers to them. One last question. Love- I love making yes. collabs. I've made, you know probably 40 of them with Vox and Hops over the past two years. I've done a bunch with Cryptopsy. Pitch Black North has made satanic tea for Cryptopsy. I've made coffees. I love making collabs. What would be the perfect Melissa Cross collab? Coffee. Yes. Or you could do um, pencils or (laughs) (laughs) you could do like um, straws, uh, flow balls, um, corks like this we put a cork in our teeth i guess and keep the mouth open like there's all kinds of little toys like yeah. those little blow balls where you blow through the yep. tube and keep the ball ahead yep. that's a really good breath pressure so you could make those and you know put my logo on it <laughs> i think the pencil is the easiest one but the flow balls would be pretty 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 sick um yeah. Melissa, thank you so so much for taking time hanging with me um i am known by people in the metal scene because of your warmups. And, and I'm gonna finish with these two anecdotes. I literally just did an interview with Derek, um, who plays bass for uh, Phil Anselmo and the Illegals. He literally just played with Pantera in Brazil. And he, we were finishing up our interview and he goes, hey, hey, wait, Matt, Matt, do you still do those warmups? You know, the me, he, 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 he. He's like, I mean, you kill me, you used to do that. He's laughing you so much. I was like, dude, it still works. I do it all the time. So that's anecdote number one. <laughs> Number two is Terrence Hobbs from Suffocation. Any just had lunch with him. No, really? Yes, I just had lunch with Terrence like three days ago. I love him. Yeah, anytime I... he sees me, anytime he sees me, he goes, he, he, hey, hey. It's the first thing he says to me. And that's because of you. So <laughs> thank you for that. I'm going to tell him I spoke to you. That's so funny. I love those guys. I, I... love those guys. I, they live close to me so yeah. i just had lunch and talk about oh what a magical afternoon that was amazing like <laughs> love those guys so, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> melissa thank you so so much this is amazing this is um i was i'll say even a lifelong dream to have a conversation with you so massive cheers to you for taking the time for being cool talking about life talking about metal talking about your sobriety talking about extreme vocal pardon 
You got my number. I'm I not do. that important. Call me. Say hi. I'm going to. <laughs> Massive cheers to you. I really, really appreciate this. You're a legend. Cheers. Cheers. Rock! <laughs> <laughs> Hey, thank you all so, so much for listening right to the end. You know that I love and appreciate that. Man, this was an awesome, awesome conversation. Long overdue. I, I've just always wanted to have a chat with Melissa. I have been using the Zen of Screaming for so many years. Uh, her voice is just ingrained in my brain, in my essence. She is so important to me, and I am very, very honored and humbled that she took the time to hang out with me and that now we text each other. It's it's surreal. So massive cheers to Melissa for hanging out with me. Uh, if any of you are looking to improve or maintain or just simply explore further your voice, I strongly suggest that you go check out Melissa's courses that we talked about during this episode. I have put the link to all of that in the description of this podcast. Massive cheers to you, Melissa. This was amazing. Thank you so, so much for everything, for being open about your journey to sobriety. It, it's just what a wonderful wonderful human you are and I cannot wait to have a face-to-face -face conversation with you one day I'm really really looking forward to that day now, if you enjoyed this Vox and Hops episode, you should sign up to the Vox and Hops Middle Podcast mailing list. You can do that on my website, voxandhops.com. That's V-O-X-A-N-D-H-O-P-S.com. And when you do that, you shall receive one email a week that will contain all of the details of everything that has happened recently in the world of the Vox and Hops Middle Podcast. You'll get to see which episodes I dropped recently. You will get to see which episodes I have coming up. You will also get to hear about any projects I have in the works. And I am building three massive projects all at once right now and I'm hinting at them in the newsletter. So if you want to hear about that, sign up to the newsletter. You will also get to see which albums the Vox and Hops album review crew have reviewed recently, and you'll get to see which albums Jerry Monk, Vox and Hops' Metal Architect, has added to the Brutal Awakenings playlist, which is always packed with just the most killer recent metal stuff. If you're looking for new music to listen to, well, the Brutal Awakenings playlist is what you want to be listening to. There is always a lot of killer stuff going on in the world of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast, and I hate when you miss a single thing, so do me a favor and sign up to the mailing list. The Vox and Hops Metal Podcast is brought to you by Sound Talent Media and Evergreen Podcasts. I hope you have a killer rest of the week. I will be back with one more episode on Friday, but until then, remember to enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. Cheers, Vox and Hops heads. Oh,